The quest for extraterrestrial life is arduous. How would we know whether or not aliens exist? An obvious response would be if they visited our planet in large numbers, as in the film Independence Day, with their saucers floating above every city on the Earth. Or maybe if their envoys met with us, shaking hands with our world leaders while cameras captured the event on national television. Or perhaps if they began trading with us and their inventions and resources began to appear in our daily lives. Fortunately or unfortunately, there isn't much evidence that this has ever happened. While visits from aliens would be preferable, they are not the only means for aliens to confirm their presence to humanity. It's far more likely that they do so with their signals. We've spent a lot of time on this channel debating why aliens might not have communicated with us. But on the other hand, what are the most compelling pieces of evidence indicating they have already done so? Which signals are seen to be the finest prospects for an alien civilization's message thus far? Hello and welcome to Z. And today, we're looking at the impact of hyperdrive travel on detecting alien transmissions. Rather than explaining why we haven't heard from aliens, let's look at where we might have already heard from them. Obviously, there is some ambiguity in what we are looking for when it comes to alien transmissions. After all, aliens are aliens. We're not sure what to expect from them because they'll have evolved in different environments than ours and may have cultural perspectives that make perfect sense to them but are entirely foreign to us. Their idea of a decent approach to greet the universe may be very different from ours. Researchers investigating probable signals from other planets must have an open mind about what an extraterrestrial signal might look like. However, such signals may be confounded with signals from natural sources that we do not yet understand. How do we know the difference? Let's look at some examples to see what I mean. As part of the Breakthrough Listen initiative, the Parkes Murraying Telescope in Australia observed Proxima Centauri, the star closest to our own, in 2019. It was gathering information about stellar flares. However, when SETI researchers, a collective term for the search for extraterrestrial life, checked through the data it had gathered later, they discovered something strange. A signal that was later known as BLC-1. Could the star closest to our own be home to advanced alien life? This signal was intriguing because it could not be explained away by traditional sources. It lasted many hours, which is longer than the average time it takes for a human satellite to fly overhead. It exhibited signal drift, which meant its frequency was fluctuating, implying possible movement relative to the telescope, implying it wasn't coming from a stationary object causing interference on Earth. One of the most appealing aspects about it was its small narrowband signal. Radio waves in nature never have such a small range, they always fluctuate. Unless there is some natural source out there that we have yet to uncover, the only thing that can emit such a concise signal as this is technology, whether human or alien. When no obvious explanation for its presence could be found in human sources, scientists naturally questioned if this was the signal from alien species they had been seeking for. Along with the WOW signal, which we discussed in a previous video, BLC-1 is one of the most likely candidates for signals made by alien civilizations. Even so, there are several downsides to this signal. Scientists were unable to link it to any obvious sources of interference from Earth-based technology, but upon closer examination of the data, it did match other radio wave signatures that came up on other days of the search except that these other signals occurred regardless of which direction the telescope was pointing. Later observations also failed to detect BLC-1, the signal from Proxima Centauri. So, while they don't know what interfered with the telescope to make BLC-1, the chances of it being interference are pretty high. Let us look at another candidate. The slightly more obnoxious SHGB-02 plus 14A. 
When Frank Drake launched one of the first city tests, Project Ozma, in 1960, he assumed that if alien species were to communicate with the rest of the cosmos, they would do so at 1420 MHz. The reasoning was that this was the frequency emitted frequently by hydrogen, one of the most abundant elements in the cosmos. Aliens seeking to communicate with different civilizations may utilize such a frequency as a sort of common ground, a wavelength that is likely to be special to any race. This may have been a leap of logic, but it did make SHGB02 plus 14 interesting later on. Because this signal, for the sake of brevity, let's call it SHG for the duration of this movie, did actually transmit at this precise wavelength. SHG was discovered three times in 2003 using the Arecibo telescope and the computing power of 5.2 million home computers as part of the SETI at home experiment, which is regrettably no longer active. SHG had no evident explanation for its natural beginnings and did not appear to be interference. However, it was too weak to say if it was clearly technical or not. Furthermore, its placement was unusual. It came from a starless region up to 1,000 light years away from Earth. And, while it did wander, it did so in a way that scientists found strange. There are a few things we can reliably conclude if a signal comes from a planet. A signal broadcast from a planet, whether on its surface or in orbit just above it, would very certainly experience some Doppler shift as it alternated between traveling away from us and coming towards us via the round journey it was following in space. There would also be times when it would completely disappear from view as it went behind the globe. While SHG's signal frequency fluctuated, ranging from 8 to 37 Hz per second, this would only be expected from a planet rotating 40 times faster than Earth, which seemed high. It was also odd that every time the signal was seen again, no matter where it had been when it was previously seen, it always started at 1420 MHz. The chances of you seeing an orbiting transmitter three times and each time seeing it start at the same point are extremely tiny, which is what you'd need for this to make sense. This discovery suggested that SHG was most likely caused by a technological fault. We gain an intriguing glimpse into how SETI evaluates whether something is of alien origin by looking at the procedure through which the BLC1 or SHG signals were analyzed. It is an approach that, in my opinion, best aligns with the words of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's famed detective Sherlock Holmes, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. When researchers discovered a new signal, they began by eliminating all conceivable alternatives. Could it be caused by a passing satellite? Is there anything in nature that we are aware of that may cause this effect? Can we explain why this signal is here and acting the way it does in any other manner? So far, alternate explanations for these candidates for alien communication have been discovered. Even after human intervention is ruled out, the potential that these unexplained signals are simply undiscovered natural phenomena remains. And this is precisely the present debate over the last candidate for alien transmissions. Today, I'd want to leave you with quick radio bursts. If an alien civilization is ever discovered, it is possible that it was not done on purpose. Powerful engines or beam shooting could all generate bursts of energy that reveal a vast civilization. Fast radio bursts, or FRBs, are therefore intriguing. They are, as the name implies, extremely quick bursts of radio waves. Hundreds of these bizarre, millisecond-long bursts have been observed across the sky. Scientists believe there could be thousands of these every day. They've usually been discovered outside our galaxy, but one was discovered within the Milky Way in 2020, so they're not entirely alien to us. They appear to be emitted by incredibly intense magnetic fields. Scientists don't know what caused them, and they don't know what caused them. There are other possibilities, including the possibility that they are emitted by neutron stars or black holes. However, there is no evidence to support any one theory, including alien technology. The CHIME radio telescope in Canada was designed specifically for detecting these brief blips in the cosmos. 
Rather than looking at a single point in space like other telescopes, CHIME's many cylindrical parabolic reflectors can collect data from a large swath of the sky at the same time. It started detecting in 2018 and is still running strong today. It has discovered recurring FRBs as well as one that is clearly related with a magnetar star. Perhaps all FRBs can be linked to such stars. Maybe not. But that is precisely the goal. Perhaps one day we will be able to determine the sources of all FRBs and know that they are entirely natural. Perhaps the search for alien life will have to start all over again. But there's always that enticing prospect, that minuscule chance that one day, as scientists rule out signal after signal, one may emerge that defies other explanation. If all other explanations are ruled out, if we can be positive that no natural source caused this, we will be forced to accept the implausible in the words of that great detective. So, while these are among of our best chances for signals from another planet, they also have significant drawbacks. We have yet to discover a signal that convincingly indicates the existence of aliens, but that doesn't mean we won't in the future, it's never aliens until it gets to where it is. Alright everyone, here's where the video ends, thanks for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.